The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Stories from the Field, building a transformative partnership with families and clinicians. Next slide, please. I'm Allison Gray, Senior Program Officer at the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. I will be moderating today's discussion. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. Joining us today are Elaine Lynn from Family Voices of California. Elaine manages project leadership and will be and will provide an overview of this statewide parent advocacy and leadership training and some of the project results. Elaine is also the parent of two young adults who have special health care needs. Also with us today is Allison Beyer, who is a special needs advocate with the Autism Society of Los Angeles and a project leadership graduate. Allison will be sharing some of her experiences with local, state, and national advocacy for children with special health care needs. Jenny Baird is the director of the Institute for Nursing and Interprofessional Research at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She's also the principal investigator of California-based nurse-led discharge learning collaborative. Jenny will tell us about the CANDLE collaborative, and we will also learn from all three speakers today about their role in the CANDLE Collaborative and the ongoing development of the partnership between parents and clinicians that has become integral to this project. Thank you all three for joining us today to share your work. Next slide, please. We want this to be an engaging conversation and encourage all in attendees to submit questions in the GoToWebinar question box. We will try to get to as many as we can today. Elaine, I will now turn it over to you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Allison. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Um, as you mentioned, I am the parent of two young adults with disabilities and special health care needs, and they've been involved with inpatient and outpatient care, and, nav and I've navigated multiple systems for them over the last 20 years. So I try and integrate my personal experience with the work that I do with Family Voices of California. Family Voices of California, just to give a little bit of background, is the state's family to family health information center. We provide information and a forum for families to advocate for health system improvements by building partnerships among families and agencies, organizations, prof professionals, lawmakers, all to really increase access to family centered, community based, culturally competent care and to improve policies and systems of care for children and youth with special health care needs and disabilities. One of our programs is Project Leadership, which is a comprehensive advocacy leadership training program designed to prepare and support families to advocate and lead so that they can be involved in health policy and system improvements. We have a train the trainer model and then we provide direct mentorship designed to help families with their individual, uh, moving from that individual to systems advocacy and developing those parent professional partnerships. We also work with professionals and organizations to educate and inform them about the value of authentic family engagement and how to engage families as true partners, rather than just including them as a sounding board when initiatives and interventions are already underway. Instead, we work with them to really bring families and recognize them as an essential partner in all stages of development, implementation, and evaluation of various programs, policies, interventions, and so forth. Our program includes a seven-part, 30-hour uh, curriculum designed to integrate individual experience with, the, with professional level skills. We start with the history of disability advocacy to build a foundation and then teach the nuts and bolts of advocacy in both in theory and in practice. And we also provide leadership and um, strategic skills that, that folks can employ. Storytelling is woven throughout to empower participants to share their experiences and impact policies in a really meaningful way. Next slide. 
The most significant benefit and value of project leadership, we, we feel, we believe in what we've heard, is capacity building. As we work towards family engagement at all levels of community and government, we're building capacity for everyone involved. We build individual capacity, professional, organizational, and systems capacity by training and actively engaging families in decision making at the policy and practice level. The, the skills from the training are transferable to all areas of work, so administrators and professionals also see significant advantages. And it also fosters and exp expands that collaboration that we're really looking to gain provides recruitment opportunities, such as for boards and staffing, and um, new champions for issues that we find are of mutual importance. Next slide. So I'd like to share some examples of successful family engagement and their impact of um, some of those participants in our project leadership program. So I'll just go through a few um, brief stories about what they've been, what folks have been doing out uh, throughout California. When the Monterey County Supervisors were considering a complete ban on plastic straws, which we hear, we've hear we been hearing a lot about throughout the state and the country, uh, but this was a complete ban for dine-in customers. Our, one of our project leadership trainers, Maria Magana, supported her graduates and parents in their area to share their concerns at the meeting. After hearing from the parents, the supervisors voted to include an exemption for people who need plastic straws because of their disability. The success of these families is remarkable, remarkable, not only because of course they got the exemption, but also because they actually shifted the conversation at that meeting. The supervisors really were only thinking about the, the issue as an environmental one, but the personal stories painted a very different picture and revealed some pretty serious, what could be pretty serious unintend, unintended consequences. Um, another example is uh, Donnell Kenworthy. Her son, DJ, has complex health needs and an intellectual and developmental disability. He needs anesthesia dentistry in the hospital for any dental procedure. In her area, it is nearly impossible to find dentists or hospitals that will accept the state Medicaid rates. And um, DJ lived in pain for months on end, waiting for one of the few slots available. To complicate this, DJ is mostly nonverbal, so he really suffered because he couldn't ask for help like, um, like the rest of us can. Donnell partnered with uh, her state council on developmental disabilities to gather parent stories, and she and DJ were featured in a state oversight agency report on this issue. Donnell testified at legislative hearings for a bill to provide additional payments to treat patients with special dental care needs, and eventually this state ended up increasing rates and reducing bureaucracy and contracting, bringing more providers into the system. We're going to hear a little bit later from Jenny Baird, but I wanted to share a little bit um, of a preview about the work that we've been involved in with the Candle Project. We participated as an advisor to nurse leaders developing and implementing interventions to improve discharge readiness for children with complex medical needs and their families. At first, we didn't see a lot of family engagement at the local level, but once the nurse leaders experienced a parent feedback session, they realized how critical it was to involve these families because they are the most affected by the interventions that they were designing. And they saw that the best way to, to improve outcomes and reduce readmissions would be to design these interventions that would to be responsive to the needs of families. So the final uh, example that I'd like to share is um, of Allison Beyer, and she will be uh, speaking in just a few moments. But Allison's son, Evan, was four um, when he battled sepsis for many months, and it nearly cost him his transplanted kidney. Allison is a member of the UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital Parent, and Parent Advisory Council, was able to leverage her experience to support a successful collaboration with the emergency department at the UCLA Ronald Reagan Me Medical Center, and that resulted in a new code sepsis protocol throughout UCLA Health. Uh, in a few minutes, Allison will share more about her overall experience with health, with health system improvements and her um, her efforts throughout different systems, but um, 
it's a really interesting example of the work that she was able to do that impacted something system-wide in, in a hospital setting. Next slide. So there are now more than 100 trainers from 60 organizations in four states. We have more than 300 graduates and we surveyed them to measure the impact and here's what we found. Almost 90% are using their project leadership skills. Two out of three have participated in a group focused on children with special health care needs. 67% of those serving on groups reported a policy or system improvement during the time that they've been on that group. And we saw an increase in the number of graduates elevating their advocacy from local activities to state and federal activities with about 60% contacting their legislator. And in fact, what was interesting was we found graduates more active, more engaged in leadership and advocacy activities as time went by. So after a few years, they became more experienced and knowledgeable and confident, and they became even more active and involved. So we uh, sometimes see a waning of participation after a few years, and we know that these families are very busy and their lives are very difficult, but once they have become empowered with these skills and these opportunities, they tend to want to do more and become more involved. Next slide. So what's next for project leadership? In 2020, we will continue to mentor and assist graduates in their advocacy activities. We will continue to partner with the statewide, local, and uh, national organizations to offer information and tools and match families with opportunities. We will also expand nationally with regional training of trainers workshops in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Austin, Texas, um, providing a three-day free training for organizations that would like to implement this program. Um, and there's a link on our, on our slide if anybody's interested in receiving information as we develop more details, we're, we're happy to send that. I look forward to our continuing discussion after we hear from Allison and then Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was a great overview of project leadership. Um, let's now welcome Allison Beyer, who is a graduate of the program. Allison, Hi, I'll turn morning. it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Good morning, everyone. You can turn to the next slide. Uh, I am a mom of two. I have Evan, he's my oldest, at 10, and Tegan at four. Evan was born with multiple congenital anomalies at 32 weeks, so he's the next 32-weeker. That's a really fancy way the medical field says that he was born two months early with a lot of things that went wrong when he was in my belly. Uh, because of Evan's complications, we have spent four and a half years of his life living in the hospital, in the hospital collaboratively. And then even on our good days where we are right now, we spend two full days in an outpatient clinic getting infusions and another day um, getting labs. And I tell you all that because for us, that hospital system, UCLA Health, is our is where we live, that's our home. And those people are our family and we owe his life to them. Um, in 2011, they asked me to be a part of the Parent Advisory Council. We actually had something go wrong with Evan as things do um, and uh, I advocated for him and so they asked me to be upon this panel. And ironically, um, before my son was born, I had a horrific anxiety disorder, so much so that I couldn't even order a pizza because I felt like um, everyone was making fun of me. So my son, when he was born, he, he saved my life and um, I had to advocate for someone. I couldn't do it for myself, I did it for him. And throughout that journey, I ended up being more um, that I could be for everyone. And I have that unique perspective because I know what it's like to not be able to advocate or feel like I don't have any power. So when I was asked to, to be on the council, my initial gut instinct was like, nope, I don't like people, I'm not gonna do this. Um, but I owed them everything, I owed them my son's life. And so I sat on that and in that council, Originally, we just sat around a table and we, we saw where things, little things were and we complained a lot. But for me, um, anybody that sat at that table loved that health system. And we were coming from a place where we wanted to see our home be the best it could be. And I think that's with any family that you can engage with in, in a health like system-based role or something where a family is a high, they call them high utilizers in the emergency department. 
um, the families that are invested, it's because this is our lives. And, and I love that health system. I would like to say more than anybody that works in that health system because of what it is to me. So in that panel, that's where I got to come from that place. And we were able to collaborate on many things. I should switch the slide so you can see. Can you switch the slide? So um, I've been on this panel for two years. I got to be chair of the panel. Um, with those two years, I was asked to speak at a lot of things. And in the beginning of those two years is when I did project leadership. And project leadership is very unique in the way that it teaches you how to do, like advocate on the state and federal level, local as well. But not only that, they don't drop you off. You don't just show in and you learn how to do everything and then that's it, like good job, good luck, you know, that's it. For them, it's not that. It's every year they bring me back, 2017, 2018, 2019, I've come back to this health summit where they teach me about what's going on. They, they taught me how to set up appointments with my, my legislators and in a way that's like, this is exactly how they want to see it from you. This is how you fax it and I, I'm appointments with them. And so now like in 2019, I went back and my assembly member, that office remembers me. They feel like family. Um, we had problems this year earlier in the year with Medi-Cal and my son and I, I, I fought, I got an appeal and it took 90 plus days. I got an extension on the appeal and on a Friday, I figured out Medi-Cal so that my son could have it. And our trial was the next Monday. So I took it all the way out and I fixed it. But in doing that, I knew that I had it fixed for my son, but I never wanted that to happen for other people. And I know what it's like to be on the other side of that. So I, I advocated and I was even advocating at that legislative day with my assembly member, Al Muratucci. And then I met him locally to tell him about uh, Medi-Cal. And he said, well, if you write a bill, you know, let's talk about it. And I knew that I could write a bill because I had Family Voices of California on my side. And that was something that was feasible, but it seemed incredibly daunting to me. Like, how do you write a bill? Um, even though I knew. <laughs> uh, so what I did was I found the Medi-Cal Children's Health Advisory Panel and I sent them a strongly worded letter as we all can do, uh, strongly worded letters. And I asked them if I could be on the council and they said, no, we don't have any openings. And then later on um, this year, they did have an opening and I was going to interview and I knew right away I could call Family Voices of California and say, hey, I got this thing. Do you know anything about it uh, or have any insight? And Elaine Lynn uh, responded, I don't, but guess what? I know someone who does. And she got me in links with the senior director from Children Now who helped uh, form the council. And I had a quick phone call with her. And then a week later, it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I interviewed with this panel. By Monday morning, they had already offered me the position. So I get to be sworn in um, for the Medi-Cal Children's Health Advisory Panel uh, in January up in Sacramento. And now I'm in a position that I can instill change for, for all children in the state of California and Medi-Cal. And not only that, it's not my position on this panel, it's all of us. Family Voices of California, all the project leadership graduates, we're a network we're combined. So it's not just me. It's it's me and the power of, of all of that. And I think that that's like, that's a truly beautiful thing that I've gotten out of project leadership. You can move to the next slide. So when we were successful um, on the local state, on the local level, and project leader going through project leadership, and one of the things is you learn how to tell your story in a really effective way. As a parent, um, our passion is what what really makes us beautiful, but our passion is also what they call muddle the message. It, it, it definitely can turn people off if you're too passionate and not able to succinctly deliver what you're, what you're trying to get out. And so I learned how to tell my story in an appropriate way. I can actually tell my story in 30 seconds on an elevator, or I could tell my story in an hour in front of a group of thousands of people. Um, and that's something I got out of project leadership. So UCLA had started to send me um, around the country. We were speaking of code sepsis and the, and the um, the partnership that we had with the emergency department because we had some really great changes when we had executive buy-in you know to come together with the health system that's when when great change happened it wasn't when we were sitting in a room and we were the soundboard uh which is often what happens with parents but when we were actually empowered to, to make change we did and so i got to speak on the national level and then so ucla naturally asked me to come to dc to do uh children's health uh, the children's hospital association they go out every year and they they talk about children's health care to to your federal legislators. And so we got invited to represent UCLA that year. And it was a really beautiful year because the uh, Obamacare, they had voted to repeal and replace it. And it had gone through the ha uh, Congress, like it had gone through and um, they were going to do that. They were gonna get rid of uh, the ACA and it was going to go through the Senate and the next day after we spoke to, to, to these people. 
and so you could feel it. You could feel like the tension, the bu the hubbub or whatever. There was uh, every time we walked through, there was reporters in the halls. I mean, it was it was quite an experience for us. It was thrilling, but um, we were reminded by the gentleman who, who took us around, he's the one that represents all the families in DC every year. And he kept saying, I've never seen a family like yours. Most people are, you know, just bright lights, like they're deer in headlights and just really excited about the whole thing, but not knowing how to perform. But because we had been in practice so often, and that's really the beauty of project leadership, bringing us back every year, um, and we could deliver our story, we were able to sit with Nancy Pelosi and explain Evan's story, link it to what's happening on the federal level and all children and why what, why, what is going on, like what, they, what I needed from them. I could tell them what I needed from them essentially by using my son's story, but linking it into the greater picture. And twice she had said that I was eloquent and she had remarked on my son, Evan, and she actually canceled her appointment after us. And she took him through her office on the third picture there. She's showing him a picture of her in JFK. My son is a JFK aficionado. Um, and then she even took them around. We were, we were walking around where tourists are looking at everything and their jaws would drop as, as she's like casually walking my son around. But that's the power that we had at the federal level because of the fact that we, we were empowered and supported and, and brought into it time and time again. Uh, yeah, next slide. And so lastly is the collaborative. The Canada Collaborative was something I was asked to join in January for, it was a phone call, kind of like this webinar format. Um, we were told about what it was. Jenny Baird will go more into that. Ironically, Jenny was a PICU nurse for Evan uh, when he was in his ICU days. So it's kind of funny to be able to see that Jenny was on the project. Uh, I could, I recognized her laugh immediately. Uh, she's fantastic. And um, so we got invited to this, but we got invited in a way that truly could transform things. Like, like Elaine had said, most of when I get in, involved in something, it's like people present an idea and then we're the focus group and they want to know what we have and then that's kind of it. And so I could have joined on this phone call and it was me and Danelle, the one who did the dental, and we could have joined and they could have pitched it. And what it was was each hospital would say what they were working on and then look for feedback. And I could have easily been like, yeah, the cheerleader, let them know. But I wasn't because I wasn't put in that position. The, Elaine, the, the partnership Elaine had with the, with the Canada Collaborative people, they, they respected her and they respected who she was bringing in. And so I got materials ahead of time of who was going to present. I, I got uh, briefed on the format. And, uh, met, or we spoke with uh, Danelle and myself and we got clear, like, clear on what we wanted to present. And so when I went into that meeting, I was, I was a player at the table. I wasn't a parent guest that was just going to let them know yes or no and kind of go from there. So I got to be a player and I got to sit at the table. And when they spoke about something, I could tell them this is the, in practice, this is how it works because we had a lot of, a lot of, we've had a lot of time getting discharged from hospitals. And I know what works. And I know what doesn't work for us personally. I could offer them stories about how things specific things didn't work. And I was able to offer suggestions um, because that's the way my brain works. I have ADD, so I have all kinds of <laughs> I have all kinds of ideas of how the world could look. And um, but I was in that space where I could say, hey, this is this is what it is. This is how it didn't work for us personally. This is how we made a change to make it work for us. This is what I think perhaps you could you could bring back. And at the time, like I know that they were they were shocked at what I actually brought forward. We were in a space where they respected us, but I think the general consensus was that I was going to be the focus group and I wasn't, I was empowered to be something more and I was able to open their eyes. And, you know, I got an email right away that was like, oh my God, that was amazing. I didn't, we didn't expect that. And I think it's because of the way we were prepped, perhaps it was because it was a room of nurses because I think nurses uh, are mobilized to listen to patients a little differently. Um, but we were able to, to have really beautiful, um, work in that moment and um, I'm truly grateful for being asked to be a part of the Canada Collaborative and uh, Family Voices of California and Project Leadership. Uh, I can't wait to see what we can do together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Allison, for um, sharing your experiences. We will now hear from Jenny about the Candle Collaborative. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor for me to be able to present with both Elaine and Allison, um, who I have such deep regard for um, and who have been such integral partners um, in the Candle Collaborative. So let me tell you just a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so I have our formal mission statement uh, up here on the screen, but really our goal is to empower nurses to lead change in making um, system-wide improvements in the way that we transition children from the hospital back into their home environments through the development and testing of QI interventions. And the interventions that um, each of the sites have been developing and working on map to a set of discharge standards that were created by Jay Berry and colleagues as part of some previous work that was funded uh, by the Packard Foundation. Next slide. Um, so here you have a picture of our um, our collaborative, and uh, let me walk you through it. So our, on the outer circles are the participating sites, most of which are um, here in California, our California Children's Hospitals. Um, one non-California site you'll see on there, um, Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital, which is at Vanderbilt. Um, that was due to some existing um, partnerships that had um, come out of some previous work but the rest of them um, here in California. So those are our participating sites. And then we had um, an advisory panel comprised of experts from really around the country with um, previous work in this space, many of whom had been active in the development of the discharge standards that we were mapping our interventions to. And then we have the core team. And originally the core team uh, was comprised of myself, our um, project coordinator, Kevin Blaine, our administrative assistant, um, Cynthia Caceres, and our co-investigator, Jay Berry. And as we began to meet, we quickly realized that we were missing a key component, and that was um, a parent um, who was gonna have sort of a consistent um, voice and presence with us. And we're so fortunate to uh, have Elaine Lynn um, be that partner for us. And we really um, uh, came to count on her, um, her voice in our central core team to advise the work that we were doing and help us think through um, where we were encountering some hiccups um, and how we could um, how, how we could troubleshoot and work through that. And we really also wanted to model for the, the local sites that we thought parent engagement was so important that we had a, a parent participant right there with us um, every step of the way. Uh, next slide. So the collaborative structure, um, come, these local teams that were each had a, a nurse site lead, and then we asked them to select um, an interprofessional colleague as their co-lead, and we also asked them to identify a parent member of the team. This ended up being um, a real challenge. Um, many of the sites uh, had difficulty identifying a parent partner, and uh, we think it stemmed a lot from um, just a, a lack of sort of existing ex or previous experience in working with parents as part of projects and knowing how to leverage their own um, family advisory councils at their hospital or making the right connections and um, getting connected with parents. And I think there was also a piece about um, uncertainty about the value and why we were asking them to do that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we had an aha moment that um, Allison has, um, has already alluded to in just a moment. Um, where there was a sort of um, connection between the sites and the, and the types of projects that we were asking them to do or that they were developing, we formed site pairs so that they could connect offline um, outside of our uh, formal collaborative work and really uh, use each other to help push their, their thinking forward and to um, troubleshoot some of the issues they were having locally. And so those pairs were really um, a powerful um, leverage point for moving a lot of the work forward. And then we have the core team, which I um, described for you previously. And really our, um, our work at, as the core team was to facilitate uh, the collaborative gathering, our in-person meetings, our webinars, uh, have consistent communication, um, served as an educational resource for the teams, and um, provided them with the organizational structure and support, and as we moved into collecting data, the data um, aggregation and analytics support. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, the sort of format of the work of the collaborative, and we think of it as kind of a big PDSA cycle. We had in-person meetings to kick off the work, uh, which were supported by regular conference calls and webinars to keep the site moving forward and learning together. And um, as I mentioned, we pretty early on identified that we didn't, we weren't having um, at the local sites the parent engagement that we were looking for. And so we had a, a brainstorming session with Elaine and talk, we talked a lot about why aren't we seeing um, this parent engagement and how do we get this going? And um, at one point we came up with the idea that, okay, if, if they're not bringing the parents to their work, we'll bring the parents to them. And so we um, repurposed one of our webinars and uh, created a forum, the, the forum that uh, Allison was mentioning. And so Elaine and Allison and Danelle um, all joined us 
and we had asked the site leads to present on the work that they had done to date. And just as Allison referred to, um, they got really um, just clear, beautiful, in the moment feedback that was so um, just pure. It was just the immediate response and how this really hit them and if it, they uh, felt like it was going to work. And I think it really was. Uh, a transformative moment for many of the um, participants on the webinar, many of the site leads who hadn't hadn't seen, hadn't sort of, I think, fully bought into um, the value that parents are bringing to this type of work, um, and it was it was just a, a collective aha um, and a really important, uh, I think, pivotal point in the project. And on the next slide, I have a, um, a quote that um, that came out as we've been um, concluding the first part of our work together. We've done some exit interviews and um, asked the participants to reflect on what was um, most valuable for them as being part of the collaborative. And I'll um, read to you this quote. Being a part of the collaborative helped us to really strive to partner with parents throughout the entire process. Candle really drove home the importance of having the parent's voice in any changes that you make, which I knew was important, but Candle really drove that home. Really ask every step of the way. That has actually changed my practice and all practice changes that I make now. I make sure that we go to the parents and get their voice and their opinion first, and then try to work towards the solution step by step, which I don't know if I would have done as thoroughly or systematically before. I think it might have taken me a couple of years to figure that out on my own. So we're really proud um, and thankful for the engagement that we've had um, from Elaine and Allison and Danelle, and are really looking forward to continuing that in our um, upcoming work, which I hope we'll have a chance to chat about um, as we move forward in the in the question period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing um, in more detail about the Candle Collaborative. Um, and thank you to all three speakers, again, for being here today. So I will start off the discussion session of, of this webinar and um, would like to hear just a little bit more about um, these, what you had talked about, Jenny, with these various roles um, for parents in the Candle Collaborative. You mentioned some of the challenges encountered in establishing these roles and I was wondering if you could share with us one or two key lessons learned from this process for our audience today who might um, experience similar challenges around getting buy-in, for example. Yeah, um, I think that um, we went into it sort of assuming that everybody um, either had experience with or just sort of understood um, how to engage with families and, and parents, and um, I think that was one of the stumbling blocks. And so I think that having the, the webinar that we've alluded to and having Elaine um, be with us in our in-person meetings helped to normalize that a bit and um, helped the, the site leads to see uh, what kind of really valuable information they could um, get from parents and feedback they could get and how they could um, talk through how to integrate the feedback they're getting with sort of what they know to be the reality of their clinical workflows and, and the stumbling blocks they encounter and how to engage in that dialogue. And I think we uh, helped to model that for them, which then made it seem uh, more possible and more realistic. Um, and I think we also uh, didn't fully anticipate that they weren't necessarily well connected with uh, their family advisory council or wherever, um, you know, access to families that are willing, that are not you know, immediate patients might happen within their healthcare system. And so um, helping them to make that connection and to figure out how to logistically get a hold of a, a parent who would participate in their team, I think were some of the things that we um, didn't, didn't fully anticipate and learned along the way. Great, thank you. Um, Elaine and Allison, do you have anything that you would add to, to what Jenny has shared with us? Yeah, I, uh, I do have some, go ahead, Amy. Yeah. some thoughts. It was um, really interesting for me um, to, to see that the nurses that were involved had sort of a certain perception of what family involvement should, would, or, or could look like. The, the idea really that they felt like they needed to wait to get all their ducks in a row before engaging families because they were concerned that they would look unorganized 
And what I think evolved was um, an understanding that having families involved at the beginning stages just makes for a much more cohesive partnership because you have buy-in and people are really invested in the success of something that they have a part in creating and they saw that it was okay to be developing together rather than, okay, now we have everything in alignment, we'll present it to you. I, I also think that we talked a bit about, it's okay to ask the patients if they want to be involved in something. There was sort of this assumption that uh, families are too busy, families are in a place of crisis or whatever it might be, and that is certainly true. I mean, I won't deny it's hard to get parent involvement, especially from families whose lives are incredibly stressful and crowded, um, but we shouldn't assume that people won't want to take part in something when maybe it's that one thing that would fulfill them or help them cope. And so we had those sorts of discussions that um, I think provided a little more insight into maybe how to find parents, how to approach parents, and, um, and how to engage them and when to engage them. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Allison, it sounded like you had something to add as well. Yes, I, I wanted to remark on the, uh, Jenny, you had spoke about even now um, asking families who aren't in the hospital. Um, and then Elaine, you also spoke about talking to families and all the considerations that go into asking a family. But I wanted to comment um, because code sepsis came into play when we were actively in and out of the hospital and in the emergency department. I mean, I think we celebrated a stretch of three weeks where we weren't in the hospital. Um, so we were actively in it. And with sepsis, if people don't know, um, you have to be in the hospital within, I mean, your son, my child could have been dead within an hour if I didn't get in the hospital. And so that's a really serious thing. And we didn't know with his life for the balance, but that was the time where we created code sepsis was because I was actively in it. And actually the parent advisory meetings are at the hospital. So I would just come down from the room and join them. Um, and then we also had a, a, a person on the panel, she has since passed, but um, she created something in the same collaboration with the emergency department called the pediatric passport. And that was something where um, you go into the hospital and then as a parent, you have to spend like a half hour to convince the, the doctor that you know anything about your child and then they listen and it's a whole thing. And so between her and myself, her daughter had a metabolic thing. So she would go to the ER and say a bunch of things and they wouldn't listen to her. And it would take some time until her doctor came and then they'd be like, oh, okay, she doesn't present like a normal child. And then for me with code sepsis, I'd go in uh, before code sepsis was in and I'd say, this is my son and there'd be a secretary at the desk and they would triage them. And then we would just sit and wait for vitals and I'd be paging a doc come down and see if my, my son was going to survive just waiting in the, the emergency room. Both of those things came because both of our children were so sick and the pediatric passport was created from the hospital room of that woman's child. Like those are the parents that are passionate and willing and it changes their lives immediately. And so I would caution anyone um, to not have those considerations about parents. Just ask, just ask. Um, we're there, and, and those are the times that, that us two as parents were able to contribute so greatly to the entire health system. Thank you, um, Allison. We have um, a number of questions that have come in so far, so I will now um, uh, be sharing with you three um, questions from our listeners. I will start with um, this first question is, is there a formalized process used to include family voice, um, quote unquote, every step of the way? And um, I don't know, Jenny, if you had a process for this or if that was part of the development of Candle, but maybe um, you or Lane could start with addressing that question. Yes, uh, absolutely. We, as part of the development of the, the grant that we submitted, um, f again, from the previous work in sort of developing the discharge standards that we anchored our, our improvement work around, um, there had been partnership with Family Voices of California. And so we were eager to continue that relationship. And so um, we reached out and were connected with Elaine, even as we were developing the grant and, and getting it right off, uh, launched right in the early stages. Elaine, uh, Please add to that. 
I think um, just from a general perspective, uh, and unfortunately there isn't a particular roadmap, you know, that I could give someone to say this is how you do it, um, because there are so many variables, whether it's organizationally, um, administratively, the issues at hand, the topics, the, the format, um, whatever it might be, what we often do is work with organizations um, and talking about principles of, of family engagement, uh, authenticity, and, and how to achieve that. And then we can obviously offer, you know, individual specific insights uh, because unfortunately, you know, every, almost every situation can be, can be very different. Great. Thank you. Um, another question specifically about the Candle Collaborative. Um, as Candle, as the Kindle Collaborative was in development, did you benchmark or discover similar programs anywhere else in the U.S.? Are there any best practices you know that exist? Um, we did not do any um, sort of benchmarking. Um, and if we're thinking about in terms of um, similar programs that are engaging families, I absolutely think there are lots of um, really great um, improvement projects and collaboratives that are engaging families um, and and in fact it might have behooved us to do a little bit more because I think maybe that would have helped us to better help our sites um, to engage families earlier on um, yeah but that's uh, but we sort of learned along the way in partnership with Elaine and are really thankful for her graciousness and um, helping us through that that piece of it okay um, another question uh, is specifically about project leadership and how does project leadership compare to New York's partners in policymaking and I guess partners in policymaking in general? Elaine, are you able to address that question? Yes, I mean advocacy skills are advocacy, advocacy skills and there are many, many programs, uh, training programs out there um, and there are some similarities, of course, and, and specifically with partners in policymaking. I think that um, how we're different is we focus on issues affecting children with special health care needs and disabilities, and we keep a local connection with mentoring from training uh, from the training organizations and from Family Voices to assist families with the issues they care about uh, in the in their communities and and beyond. And we present our training in a way that builds community and partnerships for greater impact. And so we have these cohorts of families who are very localized and they're building a community and identifying common issues and then focusing on those issues. And then our continued work from the state level with our graduates um, in supporting both the training organizations and the graduates, I think um, that continuing piece is, is different than what, what we see with other projects and programs in general. Great, thank you, Elaine. Um, and there was a question about where to find out more about project leadership and um, you can learn more about it at uh, familyvoicesofcalifornia.org. Um, one question has come in um, about compensation for families. Did you all incentivize families to participate? And if so, what did those incentives entail? This is referring yes. to the candle. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, we did not. We had actually um, fairly limited funds for each of the sites. Uh, we gave them an honorarium, and they could have chosen to deploy some of those funds um, to incentivize the families. Um, but uh, I don't believe that any of the sites did choose to use the funds that way. Um, we that was another important lesson learned um, for us and in the um, phase two of this work which is getting ready to launch we have remedied that and included um, incentives as a, a really a way to respect and honor the time that families are um, are giving us and I'll just add to that that um, we provided some stipends to the families that participated in the feedback session uh, we feel it's very important to recognize that families are taking time away from uh, their children, their jobs, uh, all sorts of things, and they are typically the only ones in the room who are not being paid to be there. 
and they're, you know, they're donating a lot of their time. And so we try when organizations aren't able to provide any sort of stipend or compensation to, uh, to fill that gap when we can. Great, thank you, Elaine. Um, another question is, what recommendations do you have for teaching physicians about optimizing parent input, both clinically and as advisors? And um, who would like to take that one? I'll take it. Yeah. Go ahead, Allison. Um, when I've noticed, because I'm able to see like both sides of the table and then join people, but parents um, across very passionately. And sometimes I would, me personally, if I dealt with parents all the time, I would come in just assuming that I knew that the parent was crazy and um, I was going to have to deal with the parent before I even got to deal with the child. So I'd like to say that. Um, but for great, the greatest projects that I've been involved in and some of the collaborations are with people who come into the situation void of that. And they leave a clearing for us both to be present and to understand that like I could add value as well. And so the way it looks, at least on my son's level, is someone will come in and they'll say some things. And then I'll say some things pretty, it's pretty direct. And so to come across this blunt and some doctors, their head actually like they, they posture up and their head kind of goes back and it looks like, um, like blowing wind at them or they're like dodging bullets. And then other clinicians, they, they get more relaxed and then we can have a dialogue and we go back and forth and whatever's in my head doesn't necessarily have to be where we end up, but I'd like to have a dialogue in which they convince me that what I have is, is not the way to go because of this, this, and this. And I feel like, at least on an individual level, that if you can go back and forth in a respectful way, you can get really deep. And we've had um, some great things where one of them was, um, I was the very first person to infuse uh, antibiotics directly into an organ um, at the hospital system because um, my son was going through something and we needed, he was going to lose his kidney and, and by just building out and talking to more and more doctors and having that collaboration. It was an idea that I had that the doctor was like, yeah, I think you can do this. And, and I was able to, to put these antibiotics sterilely into my, my son's knee. And now moving forward, they're able to understand that that can happen for other people. And it was something that kept him alive because he would have otherwise died. Um, th that's on an individual level, but then if you build that out, it's the same thing. It's understanding that we all have a spot at the table, that we all have, specialties. I am an expert on my son, but I also live in that hospital system. Like I see things that they're not going to see. And if they can come in with that sort of level of respect and I can come in with the respect that they see a lot of things that I don't see, then, then we can really create beautiful things together. But I think it's, it's coming into a situation, realizing that we probably have a set, um, we have this set idea of who people are in our brains and acknowledging that, but then stepping aside from that and being in that space where somebody can show up authentically as themselves and then you can really collaborate together. Thank if you, I, Allison. If I could weigh in on that just for, for a moment, I think um, oftentimes the clinician patient interaction, especially in a hospital setting, uh, lends itself to, to one that, that really creates and often cements these perceptions of how any interaction is going to be. Um, when your child is in the hospital and you're staying overnight, let's say, and rounds are at 6 a.m. and they wake you up as they come in, you're usually not at your best. And so if that's the interaction on, on both sides and no one has any other type of experience, that doesn't necessarily foster a desire to create other types of experiences. And so it's sort of this chicken and egg um, situation where there needs to be opportunities to have different types of experiences and interactions to change those perceptions and um, those that willingness to to continue to have those sorts of conversations that that are a little different. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Jenny, did you want to add anything to the question about um, teaching physicians about optimizing parent input? I think Allison and Elaine covered it quite nicely. Okay, great, thanks, Jenny. Um, there is another question about, 
whether or not um, hospitals participating in the candle collaborative in the next uh, this upcoming phase will be searching for more local parents to join the local teams yes we are um, absolutely requiring the the sites that are um, continuing to participate with us to have a parent um, partner and um, I think that there will be an opportunity um, for new and further developing um, collaboration. Absolutely. Great. Um, another question um, for you, Elaine. You mentioned upcoming training, the trainer of uh, training of trainers in 2020. And there's a question about how to find this information. Is it available on the website or will it be available on the website? It will be available on the website. We have a link on the slides to um, go in and indicate interest and then we'll send you more information. We are just now finalizing some details about those. So um, we'll get something up on the website where you can click through and, and sign up for that so that we can send you more information as we finalize things. Great, thank you. Um, going back to um, patients and um, well, uh, families and physicians, there's one question about family engagement and your recommendations when the relationship between the, the families and the physicians may be strained or non-existent and this doesn't specify whether this is about um, you know providing input or on the clinical level so um, maybe if there's something that you can share in terms of the candle collaborative experience or um, when there was a an issue a difficult issue between family and provider perhaps or if there was a difficulty with connecting with the family members to the collaborative. I think I'll speak, Allison. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Okay. This is Allison. Um, so I'll be speaking from the parent perspective. But um, I've noticed when there's a situation in which it's it's futile as is, that a lot of it is that they have this um, distinction called speaking into the listening. It's understanding how the other person listens and perceives information. So sometimes, especially if it's already heated, they're they're not going to take you at face value so it's it's about understanding where the other person is coming from and seeing the value that they bring and then kind of disarming the situation in i see that you do this and i appreciate this and this is what's going on here and, and creating a space where the person can kind of come down a little bit and then speaking into that you that you think that perhaps they could hear you um, because otherwise it's just going to be butting heads and nothing will come of it. So at some point you have to, for me, I have to allow the other person to be right um, and just give them that win and then kind of speak into a place where they can listen. And a lot of it is just acknowledging what they're bringing to the table and to, to really see what, they, what they're what they saying because I'm not hearing them either if it gets to be that space. And I'll add to that, um, Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's one of the, the children's hospitals that has a family navigator system. And I think I mean, we're, we're diving into a little bit more of that individual situation, family support versus um, systems level. But um, I think that a lot, it's a lot about culture and the culture that may exist in, in any sort of institution or environment of um, how folks are gonna interact with one another because the tone will then be set, but if there are organizations within such as a family advisory committee or a patient advocate or um, like this hospital that I'm thinking of has the, the patient navigator specifically for, for families who have children with complex medical needs, that might be an opportunity to, um, to shift culture and bring in sort of that third party to be able to help manage that relationship and that situation. Um, we also suggest partnering with other organizations that that do work with families to have resources and um, whether it's bringing them in for a conversation or a presentation or um, 
clinicians, providers, others going out and gaining exposure to the other organizations just to really build the trust and credibility um, helps quite a bit. Great. And thanks, Elaine. And Go ahead, ahead, Jenny. Yeah, I would add, um, I think that, um, and, and Elaine definitely um, hinted at it, uh, some of the challenges that we heard um, from some of the site leads were this sense that um, if they don't have kind of all their ducks in a row, then are they um, sort of peeling back and allowing families to see the chaos sometimes that um, how we kind of make the sausage um, behind the scenes in the healthcare system. Um, and I think there's also this idea of um, expertise and if they um, are allowing families to see maybe it, it sort of questions their expertise or their professionalism. Um, and I prefer to think about it as um, we all bring uh, different types of expertise and, and we have mutual expertise and we can kind of all learn and grow from each other. Um, and so I think uh, recognizing those um, fears that people have and, and sort of working to unpack those a little bit um, helps to kind of smooth things over and allow the work to proceed. Great. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, there is a question about um, if there are agencies or organizations who are interested in bringing in family members um, to provide input or in an advisory role, but they don't know how to find families or how to engage with, with families. Do you have input on where to start? Yes. Um, ahead, all of our communities have community-based organizations for uh, where families may be involved. They may be family resource centers that support families specifically of children with disabilities and, and um, special, various special needs. There may be condition-specific organizations such as Down syndrome, epilepsy, autism, those sorts of groups. There are many more, of course. Um, but reaching out to those types of groups that are already working with families is a good start. Great, thank you. Any other input that you would add to that um, from your perspective? Jenny, when you were, um, you know, charged with including families in the Candle Collaborative? Um, I mean, Family Voices is such an incredible partner for us, so that was um, sort of our natural connection. Um, but we definitely did encourage each of the sites to um, to reach out and to think broadly. Um, one of the sites ended up, um, the, you know, having uh, engaging with parents that weren't necessarily a uh, part of their formal Family Advisory Council, um, but just that they had had connections with, and they were, it was a family who had several admissions on the unit, so they had become familiar with. And so they kind of just used different strategies to approach families and, and get them engaged. Great, thank you. Um, we are getting close to time, so I'm afraid that is all the time that we have today for questions. Um, I thank everyone for joining us and we hope that you found the discussion informative and thank you again to our speakers. Candle will be joining us again for another webinar in April that will include highlights from some of the local sites that participated in phase one of their work as well as some of the products that will be made available during um, this upcoming phase two. So we hope that you will join us then and um, hope that you have a great day. Thank you very much.